Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is seven o'clock and it is time to commence our Science for Communities lecture, um, the first of our Autumn 2021 series. Uh, my name is Tom Miller and I have the honor and privilege of being the sixth director of the Chesapeake Biological Lab, which is the founding laboratory of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, which has a unique legislative mission to conduct research on any aspect of the environment that affects the citizens of Maryland and to train the next generation of environmental leaders through innovative graduate programs. We have been doing these lectures now for over a decade. In that time, we have welcomed uh, people to the laboratory for in-person lectures, which have uh, an opportunity for rich interaction with the community. Obviously, with the onset of the pandemic in March 2020, we had to abandon in-person seminars, and we were really hopeful that for this autumn, we would again be able to welcome people back to our main lecture hall and present uh, these exciting seminars to you in person. But as a science institution, we looked at the data, we looked at the health risk to many of our visitors and decided that it wasn't quite the time to open our institution back up to the general public. And so we switched once again to offer these lectures virtually. It has the disadvantage that we cannot welcome you in person, but it has the advantage that perhaps we reach a broader audience across the state and across the nation. So for this season, we decided to focus on climate change. It was an easy choice. We have COP26 coming up in Glasgow shortly a gathering of world leaders that are committed to making a change in the trajectory of the future climate. So we thought what better opportunity than to provide a selection of six lectures that share a common feature on our changing world and how climate is driving that change. Tonight we'll have a Climate 101 and I'll introduce this evening's speaker shortly. Next week, Dr. Mark Cochran from our Appalachian Lab in the western part of the state will be giving a presentation on wildfire dynamics and how those are changing with climate. And one doesn't need to watch the news for very long to see headline news about wildfire threats and the sizes of recent wildfires. Following that, Dr. Jenny Neslidge will talk about how climate is affecting the distribution of fish and also the distribution of our fisheries by studying one particular fish in, uh, in detail, the golden tile fish. We often hear a lot about climate change affecting the Arctic more rapidly than anywhere else on the globe. And so one of our researchers, Dr. Jackie Grebmeyer, will be talking about their innovative work tracking climate change in the Arctic through a distributed biological observatory. For the fifth lecture of the series, we're delighted to welcome a colleague from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Dr. Libby Jewett, who is one of the co-authors of an upcoming IPCC report. And she will give a presentation on how IPCC reports are put together, discussing the depth of the science the detailed reviews and revisions that go on to these reports before they are released through the UN to the general public. And then finally, for the sixth lecture, uh, we bring back one of our own scientists, Dr. Slava Lubček, who is a statistician and has been working on calculating risk of rare events associated with climate change and how those calculations affect the kinds of decisions that insurance companies and perhaps other organizations have to make to guide their investments. So it really, as you can see, is a diverse range of presentations, and we look forward to welcoming you to each of those over the coming weeks. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I have to thank our two principal sponsors, 
Southern Maryland Toyota and Team Hyundai, uh, as well as PNC Bank, who provide support to normally provide tea and refreshments and cookies to our guests, but now to support our, our advertising these series, and we thank them for their support. So to tonight's speaker, um, tonight I'm delighted to introduce one of CBL's faculty members, Dr. Hallie Kilborn. Hallie is uh, a recognized expert on the paleoecology and paleoclimate of ancient oceans and using information reconstructed from corals to inf make inferences about prior climate conditions and how that may infer what's going on today. Uh, tonight, she is going to give a Climate 101 that describes the climate system, what causes change seasonally temp and over longer interannual periods. At the end of the presentation, I will moderate questions um, that arise through the presentation because this is a Zoom conference, not a Zoom meeting. We will not be able to ask you to unmute and ask your question in person. But if you type your question into the chat box, I'll do my best to moderate those questions at the end of the seminar and ask a sort of balanced selection of the questions that you have. And with that, it's my real pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Hallie Kilborn. Hallie, over to you. I always forget to unmute. Thank you, Tom. Um, so uh, today I wanted to, I was tasked with saying, giving a lecture on Climate 101. And I thought, oh, this is hard. Um, I actually teach a whole course on this. Um, how am I going to take a graduate level one semester course and sum it up in one lecture? Um, well, I decided to start with the, these stripes. These are our climate stripes. Um, I hope today to talk to you about how our climate is changing. How do we know humans are causing it? So what? Earth's climate has always changed um, and, and put that put our current changes in perspective of the past, because as Tom mentioned, that is my specialty. Um, and then I'll talk about a little bit about now what, because I always feel like I, I don't want to end a lecture just saying we're doomed. So I wanted to uh, talk about what, what the next steps are. So let's start with he, right here. Um, Someone with a lot of foresight started taking temperatures off of the pier here at CBL in 1938. Daily temperatures. We have um, about an 80 year long record now, a little over 80 years. And um, the temperatures here, we can say without a doubt, off our pier has warmed. Um, and if you put a trend line in that, it's about 2.2 degrees C per decade, which means that over the course of the record, it has warmed by 1.6 degrees C or almost three degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I wanna credit my colleague Ed Hawkins uh, who, who came up with the warming stripes concept um, because it's certainly become a, a very powerful meme um, that shows how our climate is changing. Um, but when I, when I was tasked with this Climate 101 35 minute lecture, I thought, what is a way I can summarize everything really concisely? And I thought, do you know what? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just came out with their physical science basis chapter of, of the first of the six assessment report sections. And I thought, this is this is the way. Um, so I'm going to summarize a lot of what's in this. It just came out last month. That means that the only thing that has gone through copy edit is the summary for policymakers, but the whole thing's online. And so I was able to pull some figures out from that. Um, not a lot because they actually have a, a, a big uh, sort of final version um, 
what does it say? It, it, final version, uh, pending copy, e copy editing and written all over. So some of the figures are impossible to read properly um, for a presentation. But I, 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 I um, am trying to show you what they found. Um, so what is this sixth assessment report? Um, it's an analysis, a review of the current state of knowledge of the field of climatology. Um, it was put together by 234 authors from 65 different countries. Um, about 30% of them were women, 70% of them men. 30% um, of the authors were new to the IPCC as a, as a process. Basically, they pull people like me. I have several colleagues who've, who've done this. Um, I've been involved in editing sessions. Um, so they're, they're just people like me in most cases contributing their time um, to trying to state what the best consensus is scientifically about the state of the system. Um, the review process covered over about 14,000 scientific publications. Um, there were over 78,000 review comments. Each one of those comments has to be addressed. And there's a documentation of how that comment got addressed. Um, and then 46 countries did a final comment um, on, before, uh, on the distribution. So, so basically like, things like you need to say that Hong Kong is in China and not, not treated independently because the, the Chinese have, that's a very political statement in there. So, so there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of political things that get, get put through on, on that. Um, but the science is left to the scientists. Um, and th these are their, their basic uh, summary here, the main point that they wanted to say, say and I'll, I'll say it here. So re recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and unprecedented in thousands of years. Unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, Limited warming, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C will be beyond reach. Locally, we're already there. I just showed you that. It's an indis it, it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts, more frequent and severe. Climate change is already affecting every region on earth in multiple ways. And we'll, we'll learn about some of those ways um, over the course of this seminar series. So the changes we experience will increase with further warming, things become more extreme. There's no going back from some of the changes in the climate system, that, that ship has sailed. However, some changes could be slowed and others could be stopped by limiting warming. I'll tell you the thing that puts fear in my heart is, is melting of, of high latitude uh, glaciers. To limit warning, warming, strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases are necessary. So oh, this would not only reduce the consequences of climate change, but also improve air quality. So, a main conclusion from the report is that human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in the last 2000 years. Um, now, this graph here is the one part where, uh, where I have data somewhere in here, uh, right in this part of the graph. Um, so as a paleoclimatologist, I am a specialist in, look, in reconstructing past ocean temperatures from the chemistry of corals. So the corals, like other natural paleoclimate archives, such as ice cores, tree rings, marine sediments, among others, um, they we we measure the chem the chemistry or physical properties in these uh, archives that are sensitive to temperature, and we do it all over the world, and then we can put them all together, put all those records together, and come up with what is the average over the the globe, um, and that's where that's what this is I've been working on this this project called um, Pages 2K to get um, Pages stands for Past Global Changes, and we've been um, essentially uh, getting 
paleoclimate experts to gather all of the data that we have for the last 2000 years over the, the globe. We've been working on it for about a decade and it's still going on. Um, and that's what this is, this is, this actually, this graph comes from the pages 2K effort that I've been involved with for since about 2011. Um, and so what we, we, we've got this temperature record, we know that the earth was relatively stable. And then there was a, a weak cooling in recent centuries before the modern warming. Um, and that, that just gives us a pause to see our warming is really quite unprecedented in recent centuries. Um, so another another thing that uh, that the uh, physical science uh, basis report concludes is that climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe, with human influence contributing to many observed changes in weather and climate extremes. Now we can't we can't say this heat wave was caused by global warming, although in some cases we're getting to to be able to say that that this heat wave was made more likely because of global warming. But um, but what we can say is that extremes of weather have changed. The statistics of weather that's what the study of climate is, have changed. And um, this, this figure sort of shows where studies have shown changes in hot extremes. And so where this, they, they broke up the globe into uh, very large segments. So North America is really these, these segments here, there's Central America, there's South America, Eurasia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, all one big lump. Um, but essentially, there is very high confidence of a human contribution to warming extremes. There's a few areas where there's, there's little agreement in the data. Um, and there are a few areas where there's very little data or literature. Um, so the, the uh, scientists who, who put this together also uh, did a synthesis for heavy precipitation. We see um, the northern uh, northern Europe has a very strong uh, confidence that heavy precipitation changes are human induced. Um, we see through much of um, many places in the world have seen an increase in heavy precipitation. Some places, large place, parts of Africa, South America have very little limited data. Um, and in other places, it's complex. There's, there's very little agreement. Those places often have a lot of spatial heterogeneity. These things like the Western US where there's a lot of mountains. So some places are in rain shadow and other places get rain and, and, and it's all very complicated. So what happens in a big, big area is, is very different. So there's very low agreement. Um, so similarly, they looked at agricultural and ecological drought. Um, the signals are not as strong here. There's, a, there's very low agreement in a lot of places, and it signals that there's this, a play, this is a, uh, a direction that we as scientists need to go to really nail this down, um, to understand drought. Um, but essentially, we see we are warming. We see we have more extreme weather, um, but, but the climate is always changing. So how do we know this is not just a natural cycle? That's something I, I get a lot when I talk to people. Um, and, and as a paleoclimatologist, I have, I have good insight on this. Um, so this is, this is where I've, I've taken a figure from the, uh, from the main um, I, IPCC report. And thus it says accepted version um, subject to final editing. Um, but it was, worth it to put on here because I think it makes an important point. Um, and that important point is that carbon dioxide is the largest control knob for Earth's climate. And I'm, I'm quoting a colleague, uh, Richard Alley at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, he, he, I think he gave a talk a few years ago with that name. Um, but he's right. CO2 essentially controls Earth's climate. Um, and we see that in the evidence in the geologic record. So I use corals to reconstruct past temperatures, but there are techniques to reconstruct past atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. So uh, this uh, 
squiggly line here, right here, is, is a, a record of ice core um, carbon dioxide. And what happens is the bubbles in the ice core are preserved and they're isolated. And we can, um, we can break those bubbles in, in a laboratory and measure the carbon dioxide concentrations directly from, from atmosphere that was trapped many hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the ice core record goes back to 800,000 years. That's um, the oldest continuous record we've got. Then we have other estimates of carbon dioxide with large uncertainties, but certainly uh, the trends are clear that carbon dioxide was a lot higher um, many millions of years ago. So the, the, the bottom axis here is time. And up on this graph, this axis is carbon dioxide. Um, at the bottom, we have temperature. So marine sediment cores um, all from all over the, the globe have been used to reconstruct uh, global temperatures that seem to co-vary with uh, the ice ages here in these records from the ice core. Um, and, um, and, and we see cha global changes in temperature and we can actually look at marine sediments that are even older in the millions of years or tens of millions of years. And we see as you go further back in time, it was warmer. And if you look at these two graphs and kind of squint, they are very similar. And that is because true to physical theory that was developed in the late 1800s, carbon dioxide absorbs heat and it does so in the atmosphere and it warms our planet. So, um, so in fact, carbon dioxide and, and temperature are linked for the last 60 million years. Um, 65 million years was the age of the dinosaurs, was when the dinosaurs died out. So, so this has been a long time coming. Now, if you look on the right-hand side of this, um, you see the instrumental record, um, historical measurements of carbon dioxide in black. And then we have this blue, yellow, and red future potential carbon dioxide. And this is where we have choices in what happens. Um, and similarly, we have choices in how warm we get. We can put as much carbon dioxide as was in the atmosphere just after the dinosaurs died out. And we will have temperatures that are similar to just after the dinosaurs died out. So how do we know that we are causing these changes? Um, so that's where computer climate models actually come into play. Um, the, we can, okay, how do I describe climate models? Climate models permit us to encode the laws of physics into a computer model. And there's conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, um, all these basic rules um, of fluid dynamics. This is how these are the equations of state of water, et cetera. Um, and and we, we encode that in the model and we kind of let it go. And amazingly, it comes out with a climate that looks fairly close to what we have today. It's taken many, many decades of, of uh, work by many scientists to, to get there. Um, but what we do with those very sophisticated climate models is we can say, okay, well, let's, let's simulate our, the, uh, uh, the observed climate. So with what we have for, um, for human impacts or uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols, as well as volcanoes and changes in solar forcing from the sun. Um, and when we do that, we can simulate, that's, that's the brown curve and the, air, the, the uh, range there. We can simulate modern observed warming, which is in black. When we take out the human factors of aerosol pollution and greenhouse gases, we run the model again and we can't make it warm like it is today. That's the green. And so that gives us, that's what we, what we call an attribution study. We can attribute recent warming to human factors because we know that, that when we simulate the climate, which we, we actually do a fairly good job of it, um, we, we can't make 
those models work unless you add in the greenhouse gases where we can't make them simulate the, the modern warming. So that's one approach. And when, when you add up um, the hu human drivers of aerosols, that's, that's, that's a negative impact on, on warming. In other words, it cools the atmosphere, put a lot of pollution into the air and it actually reflects the sunlight. Um, and you put in the greenhouse gases and they sum up to a total human influence based on the models. And look, it looks a lot like the observed warming. Um, you can do this in another way. You can actually uh, attribute uh, contribution of warming based on a sensitivity analysis. So this is sometimes called uh, radiative forcing studies. So you can ask, what is the sensitivity of the climate system to changes in X, whatever variable you want, whether it's uh, sulfur dioxide uh, pollution or whether it's methane or carbon dioxide or anything, any of the other, other important factors. Um, but then you, you measure that factor from historical records. We have, we have measurements and, and, um, or records of some sort. Um, and we say, okay, well, if, if it's sensitive to this amount of change, then we've had Y amount of change. We can then determine how much recent changes can be attributed to that factor. Um, and when you add all of those factors up, you get something very similar to today's recent warming. So that's, that's how we know the human activities beyond just theoretical um, and, and just the, this actually is, is how we sort of use the models to, to help us understand that. So we've established that the earth is warming and the climate is changing. We've established that human activities are the cause. What's going to happen in the future? Um, that really depends on what we do. So our total warming in the total global warming really is dominated by both past and future CO2 emissions. But what's done is done. Um, we can't change the past. All we can do is change the future. Um, and we have some pretty stark choices. Um, we've already warmed the earth by about a degree. It's a little over a degree now. Um, it was about a degree in the 20th century. And there are some these, these uh, gra I've graphed here potential futures. And they have these SPP um, and then numbers behind them. And th that SPP stands for shared socioeconomic pathways. These are basically sort of thought experiments of what could potentially happen in the future. Um, and it really depends on the evolution of human social systems and economic systems. And of course, the future is the future. We can't tell, but we can make some choices. Um, and the question is, do we want to choose something in the blue here where uh, we limit warming or do we want to choose somewhere in the red here or somewhere in between? Um, so these, uh, these scenarios um, are, well, they are associated with both a narrative of human development, but also pat particular time evolutions of uh, important uh, factors of global warming. So um, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or methane or nitrous oxide and, and things like aerosol pollutants, such as sulfur dioxide. Um, so these, these are then put into model, into the, those climate models, and we can, we can project what the impact of those different uh, potential scenarios are. Um, and we see that um, with those scenarios, there's differing amounts of warming. And with every increment of global warming, the changes get larger, um, in temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture. And soil moisture is important because our agriculture is dependent on soil moisture. So, um, so here is warming. Um, this is observed warming per degree C of, of or observed changes per degree C of warming. 
this is what we've observed. Um, and we see what uh, Dr. Miller talked about with the uh, Arctic amplif amplification, the changes up at high latitudes are very much stronger than they are at lower latitudes. Um, and we see that the changes that we observed are very sim similar to that which we are simulating. Um, one difference is the extent to which there's a little warming hole here in the North Atlantic. That's actually a topic that I study. I've been leading a working group on that. Um, I've also been working with uh, Dr. Slava Lupčić, who will be giving us a seminar later in this semester, or not semester, later in the, uh, in the series. Um, he and I have been working together to test a hypothesis about what's driving this. So, but, but apart from that detail, um, and that's, that's sort of where the cutting edges is, some of the details in these things, the big picture is very similar. Um, the warming gets more and more extreme. We see land warms more than the ocean um, and the poles warm more than the low latitudes. Very, something that IPCC has been, and climate, my, my climatology colleagues have been saying for a long time. Well, what's, what, what does the precipitation map look like? Well, with increased warming, we see wet areas get wetter, dry areas get drier. Um, and it, the changes are more extreme um, with more warming. So this is the impetus to keep warming to a minimum. 1.5 degrees would be ideal. Two degrees, you start getting some pretty strong changes, but it's certainly better than going to four. S similarly, soil moisture, um, and you see some pretty strong changes at one and a half degrees C, and stronger, the warmer it gets. Um, so the warming caused by humans affects, um, and, and I shouldn't say just the warming, the changes to the climate system. That's why we talk about climate change instead of global warming, because it's not just warming that's the problem. Um, it's all the other things that happen as well. Um, so basically all climate system components are affected. Um, and that in turn affects other, other systems. The, the ecology of, of the globe um, and humans. So some of the components respond immediately, some over decades and others over centuries. So as we change our greenhouse gas emissions over decades, global, global warming occurs over decades. Um, and these are, these are sort of the, the war amount of warming we can expect under different scenarios of future, future emissions. Um, there are other variables that I haven't even touched on, such as uh, changes in ocean pH really affecting um, ocean ecosystems that, that has, a, has a big potential impact. Um, another another uh, factor, which I actually have given a talk on in, in this the, in prior series, is sea level. So different changes in, in sea level are possible with different scenarios. Um, I think the IPCC has always uh, underestimated the sort of low likelihood, high impact storyline of ice sheet instability. Um, as a geologist, I know those ice sheets have been unstable in the past, and I think there's no reason to believe they will be more stable in the future. Um, so um, it's a very it's it's a huge unknown and and very uncertain in terms of our ability to predict. Um, but it would have a huge impact on changing um, the, the change, changing the world we live in. Let's just put it that way. So um, every ton of emissions adds to global warming. So there's basically a linear relationship between the amount of CO2 that we put out and the amount of warming. So if we stop emitting CO2, we'll stop warming. And if we don't, we will continue warming. Um, so this, this basically our, our warming is directly proportional to the emissions. Um, so what do we need to do? Well, 
I showed you those blue curves, those shared socioeconomic pathways. What is that, the bluest of the blue, the, the shared socioeconomic pathway number one um, that keeps us to a limited temperature? Um, that is described as such. The, the world shifts gradually towards a more sustainable path with inclusive development that respects environmental boundaries. And that's, that's, that's describing um, the idea that many different um, environmental parameters have a certain boundary of, beyond which you don't want to cross or it will be a major uh, threshold of um, sort of the ecological disaster. Um, so by respecting those boundaries and staying in sort of the green donut hole in this, in this graph. Management of the global commons improves. So we are better at sharing fisheries, at, at sharing atmosphere, um, et cetera. Educational and health investments accelerate the demographic transition. There's an emphasis on economic growth that shifts toward a, an emphasis of well-being rather than just production. Um, there is an increasing commitment to achieving development goals and reducing inequality. Um, there is uh, a change that consumption then becomes more oriented towards uh, or less oriented towards material growth and uh, is lower in resource and energy intensity. Um, so we, we don't have the material um, sort of output that we do today. Um, so that's what the scenario sort of the narrative is. Um, how we get there, that's a political question. I don't even begin to, to the, that's a policy question and I'm not a policy person. I can talk about climate physics until the cows come home. But we have a chance to come together as a species and improve things. Um, and Tom mentioned this in, his, in the introduction, but um, the COP26, which is the 26th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, is in uh, the UK this, uh, this fall. And they are really trying to get commitments from countries to keep net uh, our emissions um, lower and keep keep the earth within the 1.5 degrees of warming um, and to get to net zero by mid century. They want to sort of help uh, communities adapt um, to protect them from the largest changes uh, that are coming um, and, and, and also protect natural ha habitats um, and mobilize, quite honestly, they need to mobilize the financing to help developing nations mitigate and adapt. Um, that's, that's part of the reason that this exists. Um, so uh, just prior to the the conference of parties that's happening in November, the UN put out a synthesis report um, that basically shows all of the national contributions that have been uh, publicly announced, kind of they add up and say, okay, how well did you guys do to, to keeping our greenhouse gas emissions within sort of the range, um, that blue range of the scenarios. And currently the commitments are shown in this red wedge. The red wedge is goes along to the the, the this this yellow line, um, which has at 4.5 degrees of warming by 2100. So um, that's not where we need to be. Uh, we need to get lower, um, and hopefully they will late like November. Um, so there's really the, the, there's no way around this. We need to engage everyone, individuals, companies, NGOs, civil society, governments with lots of policy options. Um, and we need to attack the pro problem from different directions. So we can't just reduce one human activity, um, take all coal fire power plants and do away with them and change to renewables. But we actually have to do a lot of different things. It, it, it has to do with, um, increasing renewables, increasing energy efficiency, 
changing land use. Um, and a lot of that has to do, has, uh, is impacted by policy. Um, but, um, and, and, and we also need to, to just generally minimize our, our greenhouse gas emissions that are not CO2. Um, it's getting to the point where if we want to maintain, um, if we want to sort of slowly steer this ship, it's going to be hard to avoid carbon capture. Um, and we, we, there, we also need to remove, reduce emissions from the transportation sector. So basically we have to, to do a lot of changes fairly fast, but I think if there's anything that this last year and a half of pandemic has taught me in particular is that we are very adaptable. Uh, we've had to learn to be adaptable. Um, so I will end here with these thoughts. Um, and uh, so just give you, uh, if you want inf more information about the IPCC report um, and the figures that I've shown here, um, you're welcome to, to follow some of these links to, uh, for more information. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Howie. Um, I was struggling to take my mask off and it was caught up in, in my glasses. You would have thought after a year and a half, I would have learned to take a mask off without ripping my glasses off my face, but evidently not. So um, let me try and moderate some of the questions for, for, for you. And um, this is the first one. And I think it's a question you probably have received uh, before, but it's one that I think is an important question um, given our, uh, or given the role of science in um, what we're looking at here. And it was a question that the climate models are sort of a logical consequence of the inputs that we put in. So absent the climate models, what do you think is the most compelling evidence for human-induced climate change? So for me, um... It's the Seuss effect, okay? So what is the Seuss effect? Um, so fossil fuels are just that, they're old, they're fossils. Um, it's basically organic matter plants that were deposited in, on, in rock strata and they basically got covered up and rotted and turned into oil. Um, lots of heat and pressure. Um, you can take my geochemistry class if you want to know all about the details of that. Um, so, but, um, but so, so they are old. Um, most people have heard of radiocarbon dating, where radioactive decay of, of, car of radioactive carbon, um, it happens on a regular basis. And so the amount of uh, radiocarbon left in a sample will tell you how old it is. Well, we know that fossil fuels are old and we measure radiocarbon in the atmosphere. And we, our measurements of radiocarbon in the atmosphere show that the values of the radiocarbon have gone way down as the proportion of fossil fuel-based carbon have, has entered the atmosphere. So to me, we know it's us and we know it's the fossil fuels because that's the only thing on earth that can put that much, what we call radiocarbon dead carbon into the atmosphere. We know it's all, there's no radiocarbon in that, in those fossil fuels, because they're way too old. Once they're 30,000 years old, there's no radiocarbon to speak of. Um, and 50,000, absolutely none. And you don't even get fossil fuels that are younger than that. Um, so to me, that's the most compelling um, evidence. All right, thank you. Um, next question, and that question was from either a, a Miss or a Mr. Schwartz, um, so thank you for that. Bill Raines asked, and I think this is several people asking the same, similar sort of question, as a consumer, as an individual, what changes can uh, the Raines family make to reduce their impact on uh, atmospheric emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, and others. Um, is it drive less? Is it buy electric vehicles? Is it 
stop using gas to heat your home? Is it all of the above? Um, it, it is all of the above eventually, but it's not like, I, I think people who are trying to make these scenarios are aware of the reasonable economic asks. Um, so when you do buy a car, yes, it, you should be thinking that it might be an electric car or at least the as low emission emitting car that you can find or afford. Um, when your air conditioner and heater goes out, if you have an oil-based heater, maybe it's time to think about geothermal. Um, those are not going to be, uh, those sorts of options are not going to be available for everyone for economic reasons um, without help and without policy changes. Um, I think I think that that really uh, is people. I, I think that's something that's very clear. Um, what it can also mean is making changes to ride your bike to school. Uh, sorry, to work. I work at a school, so <laughs> work in school is the same. Um, but um, and 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 I do that. Um, although I got a flat on Monday afternoon, so I had to drive to work today because I ran out of bicycle tubes. Um, but but I do try to bike as much as possible. Um, so that's that's something that is within most people's economic capability. Of course, they may not live nearby. And that's something that when we make the choice about where we live and where we work, we might need to make choices that that put them closer together so that we can. Um, if gas prices are going to be as high as I expect they will become, um, that's going to be necessary for a lot of people. Um, uh, one thing that, quite honestly, I did my greenhouse gas emissions sort of analysis. You can go and see what your 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 footprint is, um, what your climate footprint is. And my biggest one is visiting family abroad. So my husband's from Holland, my family's in the state of California. And if I make a trip to Europe and a trip to California once a year, that's a huge portion of my greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so deciding not to take that vacation, um, that can be a, um, a way to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. A major emission source for us uh, as citizens here in the US is often air flight. But generally anything where you're consuming energy or even um, material goods, um, all those plastics come from fossil fuels um, and, and they are being manufactured. Um, I mean, I don't wanna, if ever everyone was a consumer like me, I'm a non-consumer, um, then the, the world economy would tank. So I, I don't actually advocate that completely, but, but just be aware of our consumer, um, our, our, the, the material consumer goods that we, that we uh, buy, because quite honestly, that all takes energy to produce. So. Thank you. Um, Ted Turner asks whether the COVID pandemic has bought us any additional time. There have been well-documented cases of reductions in, in atmospheric pollution. So there's certainly been reductions in, in travel. So is it a significant impact to have bought us more time? Um, I don't think it bought us a significant amount of time, but it did help. Um, a, a lot of the, the models said that 2018, 2019, 2020 were key years to start reductions. Um, and so to some extent, the COVID pandemic did help by re reducing economic output, reducing uh, emissions for, for several months. Um, but things have rebounded quite rapidly. Um, so, so there hasn't been as much of a blip as, as some of us hoped, actually. All right. Um, so this is a question from Peter Markham uh, related to a book that he's read. I don't know whether you've read it. I've, I've certainly read um, the book. It's called Under a White Sky. And it is the latest in a series of ar ar arguments for geoengineering. Right, that there have been release iron in the ocean to fertilize 
of, or to support phytoplankton so they take up more CO2. And this book suggests releasing white aerosols at high levels to change the Earth's albedo. So I think the comment is really, is there a way to engineer our way out of this? And related to that is a question about what is carbon capture? Where does the CO2 go? So perhaps combining those two qu questions, um, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so there is a whole field of geoengineering, trying to uh, reduce the impacts of our emissions um, by with, with engineering fixes. Um, and um, there is a certain amount of uh, trepidation, I think, that a lot of scientists have about that because um, we know that it, it is going to be almost impossible to just keep burning fossil fuels as status quo and engineer our way out. That, that's, that's too big of an ask. Um, but it might actually save us, like get us down a little bit um, if it's things, some things are deployed, um, sort of enabling us to change our ship a little slower. Um, and some people argue that that basically delays the inevitable change that we need to bite the bullet. Um, I have grown, I, and, and there, the trepidation is basically, we've already perturbed the system. Um, because of a poor knowledge of the system. Now we, we have a fairly good understanding of the system now, but the earth as a system is, I should say, we have a fairly good understanding of the climate system, but the earth as a system is very complex. Um, and there might be knock on effects that we are not aware of that some of these geoengineering projects could seriously cause. Um, and then we'd be, have a global warming problem and whatever problem that that caused. So there's this double-edged sword um, and, and, and quite honestly, sort of fear of screwing things up even more royally than we have. Um, so, so, but I've also begun to be a little bit, I, I think that from my personal view is that, that we need to be doing the research on geoengineering because uh, we may need to deploy um, some geoengineering uh, techniques in small areas over short amount of time, short short amount of time in times in order to protect or keep certain catastrophic changes from happening. Say over Antarctica, if we were to cool it down just a little bit so we stopped a, an ice sheet collapse. That might be worth it because an ice sheet collapse in the Antarctic could cause meters of sea level change in decades. Um, and that would be pretty catastrophic. Um, so there may be the need to deploy these things, these techniques, um, if we start to see some really scary stuff. Um, there was also part of part of this was not just geoengineering, but also carbon capture. Carbon capture is the idea that um, you store the carbon uh, instead of releasing it into the atmosphere. When you burn fossil fuels, you collect it and store it. Now, where and how you store it, that's the big question. But essentially, there are there are suggestions for um, pumping it deep um, into marine sediments. Um, where it might basically solidify and stay down there. Um, there's, a, turn it into methane ice or something. Um, there's also ideas where you, um, where you um, just pump it deep in underground. I mean, you pull this stuff up out of the ground and pump it back into, into the rocks. And there's also concern that that might leak out. Um, there's, there's also ideas where you uh, pump it into rocks that actually have a chemical reaction with it. So it actually stores as rock um, as, because it, it chemically reacts with the carbon dioxide. There's a lot of different technologies for carbon capture um, 
and and that's certainly um, on the menu of things are gonna that are going to to get us through. There's no silver bullet here. There's a thousand silver BBs. Um, it's that's that's just what's what it's gonna take. All right, thank you. Um, so one question I don't know the answer to in any way, shape, or form. Has the increased concentration of CO2 changed the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere? Not perceptively. Um, well, no, I should say. So um, on a seasonal cycle, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up and down based on the net photosynthesis and the opposite of photosynthesis is respiration. Um, so plants take up carbon dioxide and then release it when, say, when they die um, or when all the leaves fall in the northern hemisphere. Um, and um, there are similarly, sim because photosynthesis produces oxygen, there are similar seasonal cycles in oxygen. The problem is, is that it's very, very hard to measure. Um, if I remember right, I believe I have seen a study where they actually tried to show um, that there had been a net increase in photosynthesis because of net, net uh, what we call carbon fertilization. It's because plants need CO2, when you, they have higher CO2, they'll photosynthesize more. And I, I think I remember seeing a study that, that showed some, tried to show an oxygen increase because of that. Um, it, it's a very slight thing and I think it's pretty, com uh, what's the word? controversial whether that they really could measure it as well as they thought. Thank you. Um, a, a short question that probably has a, potentially a longer answer. Does nuclear energy increase CO2 gases? So nuclear um, is generally considered to be a low carbon emission technology. Um, it does not directly produce carbon, um, they're indirectly via the mining of the uranium, um, but the same could be said for, for um, the rare earths that are needed for, for solar panels. Um, so, um, so it certainly is a very low carbon intensive um, option and it probably is going to be needed to keep us, uh, to keep us within one and a half or two degrees. All right, well, we are fast approaching eight o'clock. Um, I'm gonna draw the events of the evening to a close. I'm going to thank Hallie um, greatly for a very clear and cogent presentation. As she said, cramming an entire course into 30, 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you did a, a great job, Hallie. A reminder, um, well, two reminders. Um, one, this lecture, as all of our other Science for Citizens, will be posted um, to our website within a few days. Uh, and you can review this or any of our other 60 plus Science for Citizens, Science for the Community lectures over the series. Uh, and also a reminder that if you enjoyed uh, this topic and want to find out more about the effects of climate change, um, we'll be back here next Tuesday at 7 p.m. with Dr. Mark Cochran, talking about wildfire dynamics and how climates are changing the dynamics of wildfire around the globe. Uh, and with that, I thank you all very, very much for attending. I thank Hallie once again for her presentation. And those who I, I didn't have time to call out for questions, um, I'll give Hallie the questions and I'm sure she will um, send you a, a, a response. So thank you all very much for your attention tonight. Hallie, thank you once again for a great presentation and we hope to see you all next Tuesday. Thank you.